Buenas. Welcome live from California, San Jose. It's usually the other way, right? San Jose, California. <laughs> and we all use accents. I want to welcome everyone to the last Power Summit video, live video hangout. And I have to say that we have stopped. We stopped first in New York City. Then we went to Miami. Yeah. Then San Antonio. And it's not by chance that we end up in my home, my hometown's backyard. Yeah. So welcome. I'm super excited to be here, Wilmer. I want to thank everyone for tuning in, and I also want to thank our two uh, panelists. One is from Redwood City, but now is a San, and now is from San Jose. Her name is uh, Jackie Guzman, and she is the Latina Coalition of Silicon Valley. Thank you so much for joining us today. And then the other person that's joining us is Andres Quintero, who I am convinced I've met in another life. He's not quite sure. Um, I didn't leave an impression. He left an impression on me. Nice to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> he is um, the alum Rock, uh, Rock School District Board of Trustees and the district director for the speaker pro temp, Nora Campos, who has been an incredible advocate for Volta Latino since our inception. So truly, truly grateful that you can both uh, carve out time. A big fan of Nora's. Uh, she was one of the first people that came and actually answered my call when I was here trying to get people to pay attention to Voto Latino. So whatever she needs, we'll always be faithful to her. So thank you so much for both of you joining us. And to my right, I kind of alluded to him before, uh, the amazing Wilmer Valderrama, who many of you may not know is a living legend. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> He would, no, but in all seriousness, he was re recently recognized uh, for, by a Latino organization outside of Philadelphia for the incredible work of not just acting but also activism. A lot of folks associate you with Voto Latino, but you've done incredible work also with our military forces abroad and has been an incredible mentor also through the, uh, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. I think it's really fitting that today that the, the purpose of this, this conversation is going to be all about the midterm elections mm -hmm. and to talk very much about the Latino vote. And I think it's fitting that we're having this conversation in California because for the very first time just recently California's Latino community became the largest majority minority. And we are a precursor to where we're going to see the rest of the country in less than 20 years. So as always, well, uh, as always California's ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. And so for the next for the next time together, what I'd like to do is talk about what does that mean? What challenges have we seen? What opportunities do we see? And why should we get people excited to participate? We keep hearing every single year, ah, oh, this is the year of the Latino vote. And every year, we're like, ah, almost. Talk to me about that, Wilmer. Um, well, you know, it's, it's yeah, by the way, <laughs> um, we first of all, I want to say hello to all the fans out there. I know you guys have been waiting for a while to to uh, come in the hangout, so thank you guys so much for, for showing up, and you guys have been to pretty much every hangout uh, for all four cities that we've been to now, and, um, and Brazil. yeah, thank you, hey, hey Brazil, hola Brazil, um, but I wanted to say thank you to everyone for showing up, everyone from Europe and everyone from everywhere else around the country, from Canada to Latin America, uh, for being here. Muchísimas gracias a mi Latinoamérica por venir a escuchar esta charla. But I also, um, you know, I wanted to encourage everyone. You're on social media right now. You're on Instagram. You're on Twitter. You're on Facebook, uh, and every the other platform that you're doing. Make sure you hashtag VL Power Summit and submit some of your questions um, and follow along what's going to happen this weekend. I think that you'll learn so much about. Uh, you know all the different things that you'll be able to do this weekend. Um, you know, not alongside, not just alongside us, but at the same time, what you can do from not just the comfort of your own home, but in your community. How can you make a difference uh, from for whatever resources you actually do have at home? And I think that that's exciting. So hashtag VL Power Summit. Also hashtag um, VL Hangout. Uh, v as in Voto and L as in Lalo. Lalo, my husband. And. Uh, <laughs> And uh, um, and uh, and uh, let's hear some of your questions. We'd love to. I love to hear some of your stuff and uh, some of your questions about about leadership and empowerment and other other concerns you might have in your community and how we can help you there as um, as an organization. Um, and in this chat, you know, talking about the Latino community as a you know as a voting power team. Look, we we have it's like it's like waves to me. You know what I mean? I feel like you sit at you see you sit at the beach. In theory, it's beautiful. The sun is shining. It's blue, and you have the beautiful clouds and all that. And the waves come in. Occasionally, the waves come in big. Sometimes they come in small. And you sometimes it's really hard to predict. And, and for us as a Latino community, we have to be able to to really count with one another as a, as a as a as a united front. And we have not been consistent. 
we have lost uh, the the ability to to ignite that passion that defines us as a culture into the things that really matter to us as a community. Uh, and I think that that's the biggest that's the biggest issue that we see in a lot of these elections is just that you know we as a community sometimes thinks okay well. Okay, let's get out and vote for the presidential elections. Okay, that presidential elections. Okay, I win. I voted for the president. You know, and I and I think that they don't they don't truly understand that the president is only as powerful as the ability to elect a house that actually complements the ideals of the president you elected. You know, so so that to me is is one of the biggest obstacles. We we've yet to really find a way to to reprogram ourselves to understand that every election from local elections I mean the midterm elections you know we have to shape the government as a 360 we have to continue to clean the government and continue to elect the people that are going to complement us as a national community you know and I think the reason why we have such disagreements and the reason why we have such delays um, is because we don't have enough people that, that share the same sentiment as a as a as a, such a diverse and forward-thinking country that we are and I think to piggyback upon that, Jackie, Wilmer is talking very much about how disenfranchised we are as a Latino community, but there are really opportunities to come together with one civic voice. Talk a little bit about what your organization does and how they can promote that, because I think oftentimes people look at participation only through elected elected office or working for an elected, but what you guys do is so, di so much different and out, a little bit outside of the box. Can you talk about that? So the Latina Coalition of Silicon Valley um, is an all-volunteer board, so it's all run by volunteers, and we do this because we really believe in civic engagement and leadership, and we want to promote that in our community. We do it specifically with women, because if you look at California, um, and actually throughout the United States, we're focused in Silicon Valley, and we don't have very many Latina leaders that we can look to. If you look at the California State Legislature, there's one Latina senator, there's five Latina legislators um, on the House side. And th it, those numbers are down from where they were 10 years ago. So uh, what we try to do is we have a group of Latina professionals. We get together. We bring inspirational Latina leaders to come talk to us and inspire us and network and create um, a supportive community for leadership. Uh, the organization started 15 years ago with a focus on creating a pipeline um, specifically for political leadership. Um, and we're lucky now that we have Latina leaders here like Nora Campos, like Cindy Chavez, who are in elected office. Uh, but it moved from that into uh, building leaders in every field, in nonprofit, in the corporate sector. And uh, we also realized that voting and being civically engaged, that's a culture that you need to learn early. And so we started a program called the EYA program, the Engaged Latina Leadership Activist Program. Yes, uh, and uh, the EYA program is designed for girls 19 to 26. So these are girls that are in college or recent college grads. A lot of them are first generation. A lot of the professionals that are part of this organization are first generation. When we graduated, we had no social capital. We didn't really have much guidance. And so we go in, we, um, we identify emerging leaders. And they're still in college. They're still out of college. They have all of this energy. They want to change the world. And we take that energy and we say, we're going to give you the tools and the knowledge about how to navigate the political realm. This is what government looks like. If you want to make an impact in uh, housing, then you go to the city. If you want to make an impact on um, health issues, you go to the county. And we kind of do that, allow them to understand that power mapping. And then we provide them with mentors um, and bring them into our network. So when they graduate, they can get internships, they can get jobs, they have mentors and guidance. And we do talk so much about the importance of, of being civically engaged. We as first generation college students have the opportunity uh, and, and are now successful. It's our obligation to open the door for others and to make sure that that change isn't just individual but that we are working in our community to make sure that we see change. The first step of civic engagement is voting. But voting isn't enough. You need to vote and then you need to make sure that your elected officials know what the issues are so that you keep them accountable. So that every vote that they're making, they're thinking about what are these groups 
going to tell me about my vote? Because that's what really matters. You can't just go to the polls and, okay, I did my duty, now I'm gone, like Wilmer said. You have to keep going and making sure that um, they're following up with their promises, that we're keeping them accountable. Thank you, Jackie. And to piggyback a little bit on that, so what motivates you on the board as the Board of Trustees? What got you there? And what motivates you so that other folks can see you as a mentor and follow in your footsteps? Uh, my motivation is to make sure that our community, which is like 80% Latino, uh, and all the kids in our district have access to a high quality and dignified education. That's the primary motivation. I also have a, a, a child that's a, a student in the district, so that's a lot more motivation as well. Uh, and uh, and so it, it's it's a privilege to be and serve on a board uh, where I went to school. Um, some of the things that were happening when I went to school and as a preschool preschooler kindergartner were still occurring uh, when I when I got onto the board, and uh, I was able to get in there, change uh, some some things. For example, we were still at half day kindergarten. That was a 70s and 80s model type of kindergarten, and uh, immediately as as I assumed. Uh, uh, my position, I was able to uh, take on a leadership role and change that to full day. So it, to a lot of folks, that might be oh, like it's a little tiny thing in some little district, but the, the effect that that's going to have on the kids' lives for generations to come is incredibly rewarding. And uh, being there and being able to make that happen, is uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of work, but nevertheless, um, just looking back and seeing how, uh, how it's, it's incredibly rewarding. So... Those are the, that's the motivation, and that's also why I'm also on different organizations that encourage civic engagement. We're both part of Latino Leadership Alliance, another Latino-focused uh, organization that uh, pushes people uh, to get engaged, to, to be part of the solution, not just stand on the sidelines. So that's the motivation right there. And Wilmer, they both mentioned other organizations. Why? Sh and we get this sometimes a lot at Voto Latino. Why should we be investing this leadership here? Why should we be investing in the Latino community? Well, I mean, there's so many, uh, to that question, there's so many uh, categories that fill in one big picture, you know. I think the truth of the matter is that, needless to say, that scientifically proven that education, you know, really prevents uh, a number of predictable scenarios, right? One is is um, uh, the ability of this young generation to grow up, to aspire to have jobs that that you know that pay certain you know um, sort of minimum wages that actually can turn into some kind of traction for them in their future. Also, the ability to be able to be an example to your family and say, okay, I'm going to be the first in my family to get a diploma, and get an actual career, to be able to help my family on that level. I think that's also fantastic. You know, I think that. The biggest issue here is that we have a percentage of young people out there going to the prison, you know, for very, very small, you know, crimes, you know, and crimes that could have been prevented if this young, you know, this young generation could actually get the right education to actually have a certain ambition that would turn into, you know, the the safety of a normal job. And uh, and I think that it starts with there. It starts with education. I mean, I, I commend you for for what you're doing there because I really think it's 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 got to start with preschoolers. It's got to start with middle schoolers. So then they would really truly maximize high school. So then they really take advantage of college. You know, I think that high school students. They're very torn about the realities. You know, there's certain things that you know uh, that that they're living that are hard for them to see past. You know, I think that you the idea is to inspire them early. You know, give them the tools in middle school and then have them execute in high school so that when they go to college, they really, really take advantage of that education. Um, that to me is the key to the future of our community. The key of the future of our of our culture relies on educating our young people. Um, it will keep young people out of prison. It will it would it will bring a certain uh, ambition and, uh, and entrepreneurship to, to our culture that, that would definitely not only be leaning, but it could really influence, you know, the direction of where this country can go. I think that's absolutely right. When it, the issue of education, I think that right now we have such strong ambition in the, within the Latino community. And it's while we see our numbers going up when it comes to going to college, even that retainment it keeps dropping off. So ways that we could actually address that. Jackie, what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about about this issue of education, but more importantly, the minimum wage that you also mentioned, Wilmer, um, prison to pipeline right now is, is a big issue. We see Proposition uh, 47 for those in California. 
the the idea of how do we actually start changing felony charges into misdemeanors when they when they're merited. Talk a little about that. What are those issues that come in the midterm election? Because it's not the you know it's not the fancy fancy presidential election. M many folks may not be, realize what are those important propositions right now that are coming out that that Latinos should really sit up and take notice. I think you mentioned it. I, Prop 47 is the issue that uh, I think on the ballot, the one that's affecting uh, most Latinos. We know, um, you know, sometimes it feels like um, the the school to high tech pipeline is weaker than the school to prison pipeline here in the Silicon Valley. We have so many kids um, that are not being prepared to take the high-tech jobs that are here in Silicon Valley. Um, but you have these laws that uh, make it very easy for implicit bias to take part in our system and disproportionately put our black and Latino uh, students in prison. And so it's a very big issue. I think Prop 47 is part of the solution. And um, I, I don't think that putting more kids in, in jail for low-level uh, nonviolent offenses is the solution. The solution is to invest in our schools and, like Wilmer said, to make sure that our kids are getting um, the right education and have the opportunities outside of school so that they don't get in trouble, so that they have the right opportunities to to grow and, and um, be professional. Absolutely. We need more coding programs rather than, you know, letting kids just be out not having anything to do and getting into trouble. Yeah, I guess to that, to that point, I'm sure the mic is not here. <laughs> I always feel like I talk louder, but I guess guess not. <laughs> you do the time pilot. <laughs> no, but but seriously, so right now we have Proposition 47 that's on the ballot that can be a game changer for many young people. You're talking about roughly 10,000 inmates whose whose sentences sentences can be reduced or removed or um, modified somehow. What are examples? And it is from your perspective of the Latino vote here in California that's made waves and made change. Because so I think sometimes people keep hearing about the Latino vote on the national level, but they don't know what how locally our participation has changed the course of California. And so just to <laughs> you, while, while I intersect this question, um, no, the, one of the things also is that people don't even understand how much money it takes to actually keep these kids, you know, in this you know these people in in prison money that could be redirected to education. I mean, that's the other thing that we, we failed to actually bring up is that, you know, what is the price of just keeping one kid there for a couple of months, you know, um, as opposed to the price of keeping a child in, in school. I mean, when you really do well, the it's math, like it's, effects, right? like, the, yeah, it's yeah. just, it's just to me, to me, it's like that's another equation that the people should actually do some research and really find out and understand the, the numbers because that that's the other thing is like people understand that they're spending so much money into just sending these kids to prison as opposed to giving them some sort of guidance or or uh, some other counseling that, that that would allow them to make certain different choices and then redirect that funding into education which eventually will prevent the kind of expenditure, expenditure that, that that happens but anyways as I do that to you guys. And you just, question, just, you just on cost, I want to say that the Legislative Analyst's Office in Sacramento has done an estimate and does estimate that if Prop 47 is passed, that there will be in the low hundred, hundreds of millions of dollars that will be available for education just from passing that. So, no, I do remember the question. <laughs> and like getting back to the, no, no worries, it's a very important topic. Nevertheless, um, the, the the power of Latino vote is, uh, I think it's it's self-evident. Uh, California is at the forefront, while the rest of the nation is beating up on immigrants and doing what they have to do to make our, uh, Latinos' lives more difficult. California is taking the the, the different approach and in, in engaging in sensible immigration reform at the local level. Obviously, we can't do real immigration reform or state. Nevertheless, we're doing what we can with what we have, uh, and that's a result that didn't just happen by coincidence. It's a result of having Latinos in power. Uh, having Latinos, uh, the legislative, uh, the Latino legislative caucus is the largest caucus in the, in the California state legislature. It it uh, it wields a lot of influence, and so it's self-evident that the the getting people in there, uh, that know our needs and know uh, 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 that are gonna you know take a, a a firm stance, and not use us as a as a you know, the whipping boy, um, 
that that's gonna that that is extremely important. And so yeah, it's it's not it's not just a coincidence that California is taking the lead in uh, in engaging in 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 some sort of immigration reform type efforts. Uh, it's it's very important that people recognize that. I'm going to say one thing about that because some 20 years ago there was a proposition and a governor that really changed the way that Latinos vote here in California and that was Pete Wilson with his anti-immigrant Prop 187 and as much as we hated that law it was declared unconstitutional it was passed in California this very anti-immigrant law that would restrict undocumented kids from even accessing public education it was ridiculous but that actually made the Latino community wake up. So many people became citizens after that, including my parents, and they were like, we're not going to let this happen again. And what happened? They became citizens. They started to vote. Now you have the strongest uh, caucus being the Latino caucus, and now we're, instead of passing anti-immigrant laws, we have online voting registration. Instead of making it more difficult for people to register to vote, we just California, the, the California legislature pa passed a driver's license for undocumented um, residents of California. This is the power of the Latino vote. That's what can happen if we get out there. And even still, we could do so much more in California if we had all of the Latinos that are eligible actually registering and voting. And if I may add. This is his tax. <laughs> I'm going to tax this mic before you guys are here. No, but I, I just, I love what, what you guys are mentioning because I think that we're, we're now experiencing a, a, a metaphorical, subliminal, literal, however you want to, you know, uh, address it, but we're experiencing another very similar moment like the Prop 187, which is the delay of this immigration reform. You know, the, the, the delay of the immigration reform has, has single-handedly woken up you know, a, a number of groups and a number of people in the community that not only are connected organically uh, uh, to the issue, but the biggest uh, thing that's happening is they didn't understand how, how directly and indirectly this affects all of us from a multi-generational standpoint. Whether you're a citizen or a not citizen, your grandparents can go home. Right uh, and 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 not be able to ever come back. Right, they'll they'll go back to a country where they have nothing to you know to aspire to to do. And then uh, you'll they'll go back to a country. Where eventually, this family that's here in the United States is now going to have to send money, and and money that they can't afford to try to main, keep them alive in a country that they have nothing going on for themselves. I mean, that's just one 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 issue. But we're looking at at, at this wake up call, the delayed of immigration reform you know, was another wake-up call for a community saying that, you know, yet again, we're being taken for granted as a community, and what, most importantly, we're, we're being disrespected, you know, because the truth of the matter is, is you, you campaign for our vote, you know, you, you dangle the carrot and saying we're going to address your issues, we're going to talk about the things that are important to you, and then when we go and cast that vote, all of a sudden we take another backseat. Now, this is the moment, this midterm elections, it are, are so crucial and so important for our community because that's where we can actually eventually reshape and take the trash out of the house, which is something that I've been talking about for a while. Like we have to reformulate the house, we have to clean the house, because the truth of the matter, the truth of the matter is, we don't have enough support. You know, we have the numbers, we have the people that if they were to just engage, they could not deny but to actually sign a bill, and that, and that's and that's a fact. So I think that. That, that this is that moment. This is a moment where we have to talk to each other as a community and we have to ignite our families and say, hey, who's going to represent us as a fat household? Who's going to go out there and really, you know, help, help drive this, this point across? Well, and I think something that you've all mentioned and that we have to underscore is the importance of engagement. There's a lot of talk of uh, folks encouraging the community to sit it out. And I keep saying, if we sit it out, you can't have a form of protest if folks don't really realize how powerful we are. And what I hear from each of you is the importance of engagement, that our numbers are our power. And for us to sit on our hands and say, I'm going to show you, you're basically taking your marbles, going home, and no one realized you were missing. Right? I mean, I think that's, that's the big thing. But I do want to highlight something, Andres, when I, you mentioned all the big things that people can do when they participate. Something that you did, which was really particular, and you shared uh, you shared earlier, and I think that it's important to highlight, is the fact that by you being elected to the school board, you were able to change a whole generation, potentially, of a childhood education by extending the hours from kindergarten. And 
that's not not that's not something small. I think oftentimes we we always look for big wins, but that that's that's a win. And I think that when we run quality candidates for office, they understand what the challenges are in our community, and that's why it's important for folks not only to vote. But get out and run. I'm, I'm I'm a big believer in that. So my next question is is when are you running? When are you running? <laughs> and we'll close on that. <laughs> um, well, oh, you're, oh, you, oh, you don't want the mic now, right? <laughs> no taxes now. Oh, and we get. Oh, I'm sorry. And we get questions from Twitter next. What can that? Okay, okay, sorry. I mean, what can the Latino community? Okay, so I guess we're not answering that question. When are you running? <laughs> <laughs> What can okay so from Twitter who what's the Twitter handle so I can chat, shout at them out do we know that what can the Latino community expect about Voto Latino projects what can the Latino community expect about Voto Latino projects oh well we have a, a number of initiatives going we have the Innovators Challenge which is also really exciting we're gonna you know we're gonna we're gonna grant mm -hmm. so we're we're finding this 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 we basically what we're trying to say is that that the the young Latino community out there has an opportunity to create platforms that they can call their own. They create, you know, technological platforms that that you know that can help communicate, help the community on any level possible. So we're going to grant, you know, we're granting uh, the actual capital for them to develop these ideas and make them to life. And I think that's one initiative we're doing that that is a rare one. I mean, we we identified that. You know, the seventy thousand dollars a year is the the uh, the actual salary for a tech job, and only seven percent of Latinos are you know aiming for that job. And I think that this is something that with just a little education out there, and you guys a little innovative ideas, you actually can come and compete in a, in a space like that. Um, the other one is obviously, as we know, midterm elections. We gotta we gotta continue to talk to everyone, continue to drive the point that every single one of us need to go out and vote. We need to contradict. You know the the stereotype. But we need to contradict everyone's statistics and and really what they're predicting that we're not gonna do. And uh, and as a community, that's gonna be our statement, and that's gonna be what we're gonna live for. And I just I, I want to punctuate that because I love it. I think there's something in our Latino DNA is that when someone says no, you can't, we're like, oh wait, watch me, right? <laughs> and so right now people are saying no, you're not gonna come out to vote, and we should be saying to each other, no, no, just watch us because until folks are a little afraid of us there's not going to be movement. And just one last, and then with the VL Innovators Challenge, just very cl uh, clearly, uh, closely, the only reason we're able to, we're re-granting $500,000 for tech ideas, and that's only because of the generous support of the MacArthur Foundation. The MacArthur Foundation wants to create a new generation of Latino leadership in Silicon Valley, and it's because of that they're providing us the grants, and they believe deeply in the Latino millennials. Uh, but before we close, because I'm getting, oh, register to vote, remember, don't forget, <laughs> register to vote at votolatino.org. We also did something fun for, um, for Hispanic Heritage Month. We created a coalition of over 85 organizations saying we should definitely celebrate the power of our culture, but also the power of our vote. And I want to thank both Jackie and Andres for taking the time to come here today, spending your afternoon talking to us on the Google Hangout. And I want to hear a little bit, Jackie, what motivates you? And if you can say something to yourself, you know, 10 years ago, what would you have said 10 years ago? What motivates me is that I know that Latinos are passionate, creative, um, amazing, community um, of givers and I know that that's what helped me um, find my path and my career and I'm motivated by doing that for others so I am I thrive on being a mentor and helping other Latinas come up and, and find their own path. So 10 years from now advice, um, keep on looking for those folks that are going to continue to rise and be the leaders. Uh, uh, that the Latino community needs, um, you you know the 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 Latino community is going to get the voice that you've been pushing for. So don't give up. That would be the, what I would tell myself. And Wilmer, what about you? What is one thing that what's one advice that you wish someone had told you ten years ago that you would like to share with the audience? <clears throat> that. Honestly, I think the, the biggest thing that I learned 10 years ago and, and an advice that I wish someone would have told me maybe about not 10 years ago, maybe 11 years 
<laughs> 11 years ago. <laughs> you know, guys, like registered vote immediately. Uh, no, because uh, a voto Latino started 10 years ago. And a year before that, I wish that somebody would have told me that it's okay to have a real opinion. It's okay to not walk the fine line. You know, it's, a, it's okay to not, you know, uh, not, not take you know, either side and have a real opinion as, as, a, as a human being and as a member of a culture, as a member of a community and not be afraid that a percentage of this country um, and, and their lack of wisdom when it comes to not only history but where we're going next as a country would prevent me or, or in, in cause some kind of fear in me for not voice what I'm very passionate about. I wish that somebody would just tell me it's okay to have a real opinion and it's okay to not agree with everyone. You know, um, that to me was the key for me as an activist. That that was the key for me to actually have a, you know, have a platform that says, okay, I'm gonna stand tall. And I'm gonna stand by my point because I, what's truly 100%, you know, accurate for you is that um, it's what's true to your heart. You know, if your heart speaks, who's gonna tell you that it's not true? You know, and I think that for me was that was the biggest one. Just have a real opinion. Don't be afraid to voice your opinions. Don't be afraid to speak on behalf of the people that unfortunately don't have, you know, the voice or the platform to, to do so. I think it's it's just it's fact if, if anything is your responsibility to stand up for them. Well thank you so much. I think that was that was really special. We have enjoyed I've enjoyed doing these with you across the country and just seeing the different perspective. It's the last one. Oh my god. <laughs> um so Wilmer's a fellow Aquarian, so it gets a little nutty, but it gets fun. I, I want to really thank you so much for stopping by. And can we flip the camera a little bit? Because I want to thank the folks that are behind the, behind the scenes and doing this and making sure that we look fabulous, that we're always teched up. And I have to point out, guys, that I have to say that they're all fine Latina women. Woohoo! Behind the, behind the scenes at Voto Latino. So thank you so much. So well, hold on. Okay, so this is Yandari. Yandari, Jessica, Nicole, and Roxana, who is from San Jose, originally from LA, I know, but <laughs> but thank you everyone for joining us today. And tune in at the Power Summit, VL Power Summit. It's hashtag VL Power Summit. Bye. <laughs> and thank you to all the fans. Thank you to all the fans. I love you guys. You guys are always so awesome to me. And ciao, Brazil. You guys have been faithful from the beginning, exactly. from New York. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right?